Merry Christmas, everybody, and welcome to Yvonne Book Show uh, on this uh, Christmas Eve. Uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of different things today. We're going to make it kind of a mishmash show, and I'm encouraging you guys to call in. So uh, we, uh, we've got a phone number, 347-324-3075, 347-324-3075, and press 1 once you call in, and, and call in with... Uh, any kind of questions, any kind of issues you want to raise. I've got a few things I want to talk about, <clears throat> and then we're going to get to Christmas. I'm going to leave the last half an hour for Christmas. I also encourage you to wait for that last half an hour and call in with your favorite Christmas movie. So I'm going to go over a list of the top 25 Christmas movies ever, uh, but I encourage you guys to call in with your favorites. Uh, let's see how much uh, correlation there is, and then, you, you know, the list is not my list. Uh, I'm not I'm not huge on Christmas movies, but um, you know, call in today. Let's uh, let's make this a uh, a, a um, interesting Christmas movie. By the way, we are broadcasting Facebook Live. I think. Let's see. Yeah, we are live. So uh, and and I see Penny is still shopping. I don't know how she's watching this. Probably on her iPhone while she's shopping. But uh, uh, those of you who are still shopping, you can get this on mobile devices. You can listen to it any time. But hopefully, most of you have completed your Christmas shopping. I actually have to run to Best Buy right after the show just to finish up. Just one last thing. All right. Um, a few things I want to talk about today. I want to start off with talking about kind of a, a, a depressing topic. But we'll try to get it out of the way quickly. But I got a lot of requests to talk about this. And I get hounded regularly on this issue. So, um, so yeah, let's, uh, we'll just dive in and talk about it. I'm going to get, I, I, I'm watching myself on Facebook Live, and it's very, very distracting. Uh, and, of course, uh, this, this week we had a, uh, a terrorist attack in Berlin. Uh, an Islamist uh, took his truck, or, or actually hijacked the truck, killed the Polish driver, murdered the Polish driver, and then took the truck and drove it through people, killing 12 people, injuring about 50. Of course, this is the second time we've seen this particular tactic used. It was actually used to more devastating effect, even in France uh, not that long ago. I think it was in Nice, um, it, where, where a truck was driven through uh, a, a, a crowd and, and killed many, many people. So just, just horrible. Of course, this was... This was a, cr a crowd that was celebrating Christmas and at Christmas uh, festivities. And of course, this brings up a lot of questions that relate to Muslim migration into Europe, Muslim immigration into, uh, uh, into the United States and so on. But uh, let, let me just point out a few things. One, this guy, everybody knew he was a terrorist. So the guy who did it, it, it was identified as the terrorist by Italian authorities, uh, was on a watch list in Germany. Uh, if they, if the security forces, if they, if the police, if we just, if they just did their job, this is a little bit like, um, like, what do you call it, 9/11. If they just did their job, this would have never happened. And and I think so many of these terrorist attacks, uh, the fact is that in spite of the millions of Muslim immigrants in Europe and in in uh, in the United States, almost all these attacks are committed by people that are on watch lists. And if we only got aggressive with those, that would solve much of the problem uh, in terms of these terrorist attacks. But there's a, a broader question here, and that is, what should be done? And, and I've said this many times, and um, and you know, and I, I guess I have to say it many more times because people are not listening, or people are not taking it seriously, or, or people still have questions about it. But the only way to deal with this threat is to take it seriously is to take it as a real existential threat. And the only way to do that is to actually declare war and actually go on war footing. Now, that would require the United States and its allies in Western Europe to declare war against uh, the Islamic totalitarians of the world. And uh, you can't just declare war against an ideology. You have to declare war against specific political entities. And you can do that. We can make a list. I can do. I can run off a list right now. But 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 somebody would have to take this seriously, and actually create a list of those who are engaged in war with 
us. Uh, that would include Saudi Arabia, it would include Iran, it would include Hezbollah, Hamas, and Islamic Jihad, and many of the organizations that are committed uh, to death, to uh, to death of anybody who's not a Muslim, or anybody at least who, who, who does not succumb uh, to Islam. So it, it requires, first and foremost, to recognize the enemy, identify him as Islamic totalitarianism, Islamism, radical Islam, I... I Jihadism, I know I know some of you prefer the term jihadism. It's not Islam. If Islam is the enemy, then who should one fight? There's no end to it. It's 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 just confusing. It's just disorienting. To call the enemy Islam is just it it, it gives you no guidance epistemologically, morally, or politically in terms of who to go and kill. If you're at war, your job is to kill the enemy. It's not true that the enemy is 1.4 billion people that need now to be killed. So one has to define the political enemy. The political enemy is those entities, political entities, organizational entities, military entities, that advocate for, you know, this totalitarian ideology. So the enemy is totalitarian Islam, Islamic totalitarianism. The enemy is jihadism. The enemy is those who is impose Islam on everybody else. If you want to live a Muslim world in, in, in your Muslim village, uh, and you, you you do not constitute a threat to me or to anybody else, then I don't care. You're not the enemy. You're the enemy if you constitute a threat. And I don't believe that all Muslims constitute a threat. I've lived among Muslims, and they don't. But those who take their religion seriously, those who take their religious uh, their religion uh, try to enforce it consistently, do represent that threat. Those are the Islamists, those are the jihadis, and those are the enemy. So it doesn't help to define the enemy as Islam, not unless you talk about a philosophical enemy, but I'm talking about an existential enemy, an enemy you can actually do something physical with, an enemy you must destroy versus a philosophical enemy that you debate. So the, 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 the political enemy, the existential enemy, the enemy that must be destroyed is jihadism. And the way to destroy it, it is, is to destroy its political manifestations. It's to destroy its, it, it, its political entities. And, uh, you know, you have to start with somebody like ISIS. You have to wipe them out. You, you, you have to really destroy the capacity to, to do anything, and that should be easy. It shouldn't take more than a week if the United States really wanted to uh, to go into, uh, you know, parts of uh, eastern Syria and parts of uh, north uh, northwestern Iraq and just devastate and destroy Islamic Jihad. That would immediately, immediately demoralize many of these people in Europe who think that uh, Isl- uh, the Islamic State is the uh, second coming of the Caliphate and uh, will establish Islamic rule in the Middle East and the rest of the world. If they are devastated and, and destroyed, the ability to recruit new people to this ideology will be reduced dramatically. And you're seeing it right now in Nigeria. The Nigeria army is basically wiping out Boko Haram. You remember Boko Haram? It, it killed hundreds of people, uh, uh, um, kidnapped young girls, it just terrorized uh, vast areas of that part of Africa, uh, in Nigeria and other countries adjacent to Nigeria. And as finally the Nigerians took it seriously and they went out and they're basically wiping them out. And that is going to reduce recruitment to radical Islam in that part of Africa. There's no question in my mind. People are recruited towards an ideology that they believe can be successful, that they can be- believe will change their lives. If they believe that the only thing to come from being recruited to this ideology is death, then they won't do it. Now, there's a certain percentage of them that don't care because they believe in, um, you know, in, in 72 virgins. But the fact is, even today, there are very, very, very few Muslims ready to commit suicide in the name of 72 virgins or anything else. That's why, in spite of all the millions of Muslims in Europe, once in a while there's a terrorist attack. It's too much. It's unjustified. But it's not millions of terrorist attacks. It's not like every Muslim out there in Europe is willing to commit suicide for the cause. 
So if you demoralize them, if you make it clear that their ideology is a failure, that what they're advocating for will never happen, fewer of them are going to advocate for this. It doesn't mean it's going to be eliminated completely, but just fewer people are going to join. Fewer people join a losing cause than join a winning cause, no matter what the religious motivation is. I don't care. When Christianity became a winning cause under Constantine, when it was embraced by the Roman Empire as the ideology, that's when it grew. That's when it became, that's when everybody joined. That's when it became cool and sexy and popular to become a Christian. And the same thing with Islam. As long as it succeeds, when, when Islamic State gains lots of land, that's when it gets most of its recruits. When it's losing, it's going to get very few recruits. And if it's crushed without any question, it'll gain even fewer recruits. Now, you can't solve the problem, though, just by destroying ISIS, because ISIS will be replaced by something else. Just like ISIS replaced Al-Qaeda, they're, they're, they're still an ideological vacuum. You have to destroy this entire option. You have to destroy the entire possibility of advocating for political Islam. You have to destroy the entire possibility of being a jihadi and believing that anything positive can happen from doing it. And the only way to do that is to go after the source of this ideology, to go after the places that advocate for it, preach for it, give it moral authority, and also that fund it, support it, train, weaponize it. And those are the regimes of Saudi Arabia and Iran. So if you do that, if you declare war, and you, and you go after those regimes, and it could be a short war, and I think the problem with Islamism uh, at least can be pushed out into the distant future. Not that radical Islam will disappear, but that its advocates will go and find a cave somewhere and hide in it, and it, they will not pose any kind of threat, any kind of threat to us on the West, you know, and they, they will just disappear, the Islamists. And then maybe the rest of the Islamic world, you know, will actually, uh, you know, will actually be able to. Yeah, I'm just wondering if uh, the Facebook Live is working. Uh, I can't tell. Anybody, anybody in the chat on Facebook Live, can you tell me if it's, if it's actually working? Um, I can't tell. My Facebook is kind of frozen on me. I think, I think the. Entire, uh, no, just uh, just this uh, Facebook page. All right. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Is Facebook Live still working? It's working. Okay, good. So you're seeing video. You're seeing video and you're hearing sound and everything's cool. Good. All right. So, you know, they go bury and we can live another 100 years without a threat from Islamists, just like, just like they weren't a threat after the, uh, you know, after the Ottomans were, were, you know, when the Ottomans were pacified, there was very little threat that came out from the Islamists. So there are lots of options here, lots of options, um, but you have to destroy them. Now, when you declare war, then, because I get this question all the time and I got it again on Facebook, it says, um, why do I, po I pose ideological screening of Islamists? when I'm willing to bomb them, but I'm not willing to ideologically screen them when they enter the United States. Well, I've never said that. When you declare war, I'm qu you know, it's quite reasonable to say the enemy cannot enter the U.S. But you have to declare war for that. You have to define an enemy very clearly. If the enemy is Islamist, Islamists are not allowed to come into the United States, shouldn't be allowed into Europe. And at that point, yes, an ideological screening is appropriate, just like during World War II, it was quite reasonable to say Nazis cannot come into the United States. And if you're a Nazi, then you're not welcome. So ideological screening in the case of war, in the case of an emergency, is absolutely appropriate. There's no problem with it. It's important to define the ideology you're fighting in a war. And it's important to know who the enemies are internally and externally, given that ideology. So the idea that I don't advocate for ideological screening in a time of war is ridiculous. Now you want to, I know, you want to say, well, now let's extrapolate outside of a war and anybody I don't agree with shouldn't be allowed into the country. Well, that's nuts. To give the, the government the power to decide which ideology is acceptable and which ideology is not acceptable is nutty. 
except at a time of war when it's doing its function of protecting individual rights. When America has been attacked, as it was in 9-11 and previously by Islamists, then it is the job of the United States government to figure out who is this existential threat and how to destroy it and what ideology is involved and to prevent people who hold that ideology from coming into the country. So I'm fine with a ban on Islamic immigration, particularly of Islamist, radical Islamic immigration during a time of war. And indeed, more than that, and this relates to uh, Muslim immigration into Europe, I have never defended the, the, ma- the, the, the open borders let hundreds of thousands of Muslims all come into Europe all at once because, because there's a civil war in Syria. I mean, that is absurd. That is not what open immigration, even in a laissez capitalist country, means. Well, first, imagine the violation of property rights if hundreds of thousands of people are just crossing the border and walking over somebody's property, particularly in a laissez country where there would be, everything would be private property. So you have to have a regulated way in which people enter into your country because everything's private property in your country and they can't just walk across and drop, you know, a, a step on other people's property. That's called trespassing. And secondly, if somebody's just basically hundreds of thousands of people are coming in, that is unacceptable for for a government. A government has a responsibility within the domain of the borders around it to, uh, to protect individual rights within that domain. It has to have some control over the number of people there. It has to know to some extent who's there and who isn't. And it's completely legitimate temporarily, during a time of crisis, during a time of civil war and therefore huge migration, to close the border off and figure out what you do at that point and how, how, you, how you decide who to let in and who, to let, who not to let in, in in a time of an emergency like that. For example, if there was a civil war tomorrow in Mexico and hundreds of thousands or millions of Mexicans came to the U.S. border, I would not advocate open borders, just let them in, what the hell? I mean, that would be absurd, right? So during a time of crisis, during times of emergencies, if, if, if the incoming uh, uh, population is clearly, uh, in a sense, some kind of invasion or one-time aberration or uh, caused by some external event, you have an obligation as the government to protect property rights in the United States by setting up some kind of barriers. Now, you know, how do you do, how do you uh, figure out who's an Islamist and who isn't? And, and of course, they're going to lie. And, and somebody says the Quran calls for lying. Everybody calls for lying. I don't know a single ideology, uh, uh, particularly a totalitarian ideology, that doesn't advocate for lying for the, for the sake of, uh, for the sake of uh, achieving something. So everybody lies who's trying to violate somebody else's rights. I mean, to single out Islam for this is absurd. So how do you tell? This is what you have intelligence services for. This is what you have FBI screenings when people enter the country for. I've always advocated for those kind of screenings. The fact is that most of these terrorists, almost all of these terrorists, with a few exceptions like the San Bernardino people, are well identified and, and, and known in advance for what they're going to do. Right? All right. So I know this hasn't ended. I know we're going to keep coming to this and and everything. Uh, I know that we're going to keep coming back to this issue of immigration because you guys are never satisfied because I don't agree with you. Uh, and, and And I know that you don't think that what I've done is given a satisfactory answer. But the fact is, as I said, I'm not for mass migration into Europe, uh, particularly not by Islamists. I, I am if we declare war for screening, but we have to declare war. We have to have the balls to call it a war. Otherwise, what are we doing? Otherwise, you know, if, if, if by what standard are we screening anybody we don't like? Who gets to decide that? Do we really want to give the government the power to make those kind of decisions outside of the decision to go to war? I don't. I don't. You know, I'm sure I will be, and, and my ideology, we want to be the first thing so we'd be banned uh, if, we gave, uh, if we gave the government that kind of, uh, that kind of power. All right. Um, 
a few of the questions that came up. One of them was, why is Merkel so motivated to open up Germany to, to all these Muslims and all these immigrants? I think basically it's an issue of guilt. Um, and uh, it's an issue of German guilt around the Holocaust. It's an issue of uh, Christian altruism. So you see, one of the, one of the big myth, uh, myths is that Europe is no longer Christian. Now, in a sense, it's no longer Christian, in the sense that it doesn't, they don't go to church, and they don't maybe even believe in God. But in the, but in the sense of the morality of altruism, they're very Christian. So, you know, particularly Germans, because they feel guilty. So for them, for them, bringing in a million uh, Muslims or whatever is a form of um, redemption. It's, um, it, they feel guilty about the Holocaust, but they feel guilty because they're Christians. And uh, they're altruistic. And this is just them sacrificing. And so what do they sacrifice? Big deal. Europeans are big on sacrifice, right? And I think Germans in particular are big on sacrifice. So this is just a form of, of uh, Christian sacrifice, Christian guilt. That, that's what's engaged here. This is why the Germans are doing it. There's no a social, there's no po big political agenda. Now, there, in the past, there's been an agenda around immigration. Uh, it, it, Germany and the rest of Europe are shrinking populations. They're very elderly populations. They've got a lot of old people, very few people to do the work in order to, in order to finance the pensions of the old people. They need immigrants for this. Uh, for the last 50 years, Germany has had a steady stream of Turkish and other immigrants in order to work because they don't have enough young Germans to do the work. And to some extent, or to a large extent, they still need that. So they've, they, they've allowed for more immigration. Uh, they've allowed for a lot of immigration. It just got out of control over the last few years because of the, of the Civil War and because of other factors that drove these immigrants in. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, this is about altruism. This is about guilt, uh, you know, by these, uh, by these, uh, um, by the Germans, by the rest of the Europeans. And, 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 and th that is at the end of the day what is going on. All right. Um, what else? There was, there was something else. Da, 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 da. All right. I think, I think that's it. Any, any questions out there? You can call in 347 324 3075. Three four seven three two four three zero seven five, and the calls you should be able to hear them on Facebook Live, so it should be integrated into Facebook Live. Should should be it should be fine, and uh, particularly uh, those of you who haven't called in the past, I'm curious to get some calls from first time callers. Three four seven three two four three zero seven five. Don't be shy. I don't bite people's heads off, and uh, you get to be on Facebook Live with me, so that's cool, and on Blog Talk. So all right, we've got our first caller. Uh, hi, you're on the Yuan Book Show. Who's this? Hey, Eric, how are you? Good, good. Sure, go ahead. Thank you, thank you. You had to go all the way to Beijing to hear me, to hear me speak in public, all right. That's pretty cool. Yep, yep, I remember. Yep. Oh, they can't hear the caller. That's... That's interesting that they can't hear the call. Yeah, I can hear you, but but on Facebook Live they're not hearing the call, your call, which is which is strange. They should be hearing it. All right, uh, go ahead, Eric. Yep. Well, of course, if Peacock cringed it, it, with, the, with the reference to Ayn Rand, then I would cringe even more. So I'm no Ayn Rand and I'm no Leonard Peacock. But I, I really appreciate that. Uh, I really appreciate that. That's all right. Well, yeah.
Y yes. Okay, great. So, uh, so the question is, for those of you in Facebook Live, is why do I like hostile audiences and why do I like hostile calls? And, and I think the reason is, first, uh, when there's hostile audience, hostile call, it, it, it suggests that people are listening to me who don't already agree with me. And, and that just makes me feel good, the fact that I'm reaching, uh, I'm reaching an audience that it doesn't already agree, that I'm expanding the audience, that I'm going beyond that. I also think it's always good to be challenged. And these hostile calls are, are challenging calls. They are, uh, uh, they are uh, uh, you, you know, they're, they're pushing, they're pushing uh, the envelope, they're challenging you, they're asking something, hopefully, in some cases, that you've never heard before. Um, it also gets me, it gets the juices running, you know, it gets, uh, it gets my adrenaline going and uh, I think I get a little bit better when uh, the adrenaline is, uh, it, 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 it is working, so I, I like it from that front. But really, I, I love to talk to what I call virgin audiences, virgin audiences. Virgin audiences are audiences um, that have never heard this message before. The audiences that don't know, uh, don't know anything about what I'm talking about because they've never heard it before. So, and, and you know, I love audiences like that, and um, I, I think that uh, I think that it's uh, it, it really challenges and pushes me, and uh, it gets the message to new people. All right, thanks, Eric. Really appreciate the call. And uh, keep listening to the show. And, uh, yeah, it's good to have you in the U.S. I, I hear things in China are getting tougher and tougher and, you know, much more difficult uh, than, uh, than they were even a few months ago. So uh, it's good to have you in the United States. All right, you can call, too. And I apologize that you can't hear it on, um, on uh, Facebook Live. I'm not sure why. So uh, I am going to have to work on that to figure it out. I'm, I'm getting a new soundboard, I'm hoping soon, uh, uh, really soon, and, and um, hopefully everything will be jiggered together to work much better than it's working now. So uh, we, are, we last week was fine, last week you could hear the callers, so I'm not sure what the difference is between uh, this week and last week. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm something, some setting. That's the thing. I need a soundboard that I can understand. Right now, I'm using kind of a digital soundboard, something by Duet, called Duet, and and I have no idea what I'm doing. So, um, I, I think that's basically the problem: is my complete uh, ignorance and incompetence when it comes to uh, when it comes to sound engineering. So, uh, all right, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll uh, we'll keep trying. And we'll keep seeing uh, what works and what doesn't work, and uh, we'll, we'll see. Okay. Uh, all right, let's see. But you can call in 347 324 uh, Let's see. There was one other topic I wanted to talk about before we get to Christmas. Um, and uh, this was actually suggested by somebody on Facebook. Okay, let's see. Uh, um, this was on... Uh, this was suggested on Facebook. And you know what? Let, we're going to take a quick break. And I want you to take it, tell me on Facebook Live if uh, you can hear the, uh, the commercials. Um, and I might think a little bit, but I'm going to take a quick commercial break. And, uh, and then we will come back and uh, wait a second, where are the commercials? There they are. And uh, talk about, I think, what should Trump do? Uh, like, what should his administration do? What's realistic for them to do? What would be my advice to Donald Trump? And somebody suggests I cut this out of the show and send it to the Trump administration. Yeah, maybe. Sounds good. All right, here go the commercials. Let me know on Facebook Live if you can hear them.
All right, and we're back. And um, so let's uh, let's do let's uh, let's shift now to something more positive. So let's shift to uh, something that. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this. Uh, let, let, let me just mention this with regard to this whole issue of uh, the Islamic threat and, and immigration and all of that. Is I, I you know there was this uh, I put this up on Facebook and. There was this photo published in Haaretz mag- uh, uh, newspaper. Now Haaretz, just to give you context, Haaretz is the leading Israeli newspaper. Um, it's the number one. It's the equivalent of the New York Times in Israel, uh, and it, it's it's a it's a very prominent uh, you know red uh, newspaper. And it published just a couple of days ago a picture of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. So the Prime Minister of Israel holding a copy in in the Knesset in uh, Parliament of so he's reading while other people are talking, which is not very polite. But what the hell, right? He's uh, he's holding a copy of John Lewis's Nothing Less Than Victory. Now this is an astounding, an excellent book, right? This is a book that explains how one could win the war with Islamic totalitarianism, how one can beat the jihadis. And here is a prime minister of the state of Israel holding, you know, holding a copy. Yes, and 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 it is a a a, a left, a, a, you know, a, a leftist uh, newspaper, just like the New York Times. But and it had a little commentary on the book, basically positive, and then a, a connected uh, a John to objectivism, and had a little blurb on objectivism linking. I think to that minute, dude. So, wow. I mean, this was terrific marketing, terrific advertising, but also the idea that somebody like Netanyahu is actually reading John Lewis is exciting. Now, I know Netanyahu has read Alice Shrugged and he's read a lot of, I think he's read one of my books, or at least he's read an article I wrote about Israel. Um, I, I don't get too excited about this because he's a politician, so I don't think anything actually good will come of it. But I do find it interesting, and it was a great photo, and it was a great opportunity. And I wish John, I wish John was alive and with us to uh, to enjoy uh, to enjoy that picture. It was just, it was just perfect. It was just perfect. And go if you haven't read the book. If you haven't read the book, you should read the book. It's called Nothing Less Than Victory by John David Lewis, um, a good friend, a, 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 an, an objectivist intellectual, taught at Duke. And unfortunately passed away, I think it was five years ago. So um, uh, fantastic. One of the best books about, the, the, you know, it deals with history, with lessons to be learned about the crisis that we face today. Lessons from uh, the ancient world and from the more modern world, from World War II. All right, we're going to take another call before I get to advice for Donald Trump. Hi, you on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Hey, Corey, how's it going? It's 30 degrees. Oh, my God. That. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I, I think I talked about that last show, but uh, but I'd be happy to I'd be happy to talk about Trump's cabinet. Uh, and then maybe I can I can go from there into discussion about what Trump should do about taxes, regulations, defense, and entitlements, as somebody asked on Facebook. All right, Corey, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, And uh, I'm going to take you offline just because it's easier that way. All right. And Merry Christmas, Corey. And uh, hopefully you guys have a white Christmas because I tell you, we in in Southern California do not have a white Christmas. It's very disappointing this year. all right. So, what what are the what are the uh, most recent appointments, or what are the, you know, it's it's very mixed. I think there's some very good appointments, there's some mediocre appointments, and there's some very bad appointments. Um, in in the very bad appointments, I would ca- I would uh, characterize um, uh, his uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, Attorney General, uh, who uh, whose name escapes me this second, but who is a uh, who's very much a religious. Uh, anti-separation of state and church, very anti-immigration, including legal immigration, very anti-drugs, so a, a big uptick in the war on drugs, I expect, unfortunately, uh, which means more conflict sessions, uh, sessions, 
uh, more conflict with states that have legalized marijuana, uh, but also a huge, huge opponent of abortions. I expect a lot of problems with that. Um, so I'd say uh, that that is one of the worst ones. Uh, you know, others that I'm just not that impressed with. Well, Bannon is also goes under one of the worst. Uh, a self-defined economic nationalist uh, and, 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 a, and a hater of Ayn Rand, uh, somebody who misrepresents, doesn't understand, and, and obviously uh, dislikes Ayn Rand, and also very religious. If you read Bannon, he's very religious. Then, then there, was, um, uh, there was the one this week, another one, the good, the bad, and the ugly in, um, in uh, Trump's appointment. These are all the bad. Uh, Pina Navarro, oh my God. So first of all, first of all, uh, Trump has, has created this uh, trade advisory commission, a, a committee. Uh, this is the first time president has such a thing. This is the this is the whole idea of um, of uh, advise him on industrial policy. So we now have industrial policy in the United States, like Japan, and look how well it's worked for them. Uh, and uh, Peter Navarro is a complete idiot. I mean, this guy is a is a third rate economist who you know he studied economics at Harvard, but he's still a third rate economist who hates the Chinese more than more than Lee Ron does on on uh, on the chat here. He hates the Chinese viciously and hates trade and views trade as a zero sum war game. And it's just an idiot when it comes to trade and and the idea that this guy is going to have the ear of the president on a regular basis. He's actually here from UC Irvine, and I've bumped into him a few times, and I just disagree with him so thoroughly about these issues. He's basically made a career, made a career of, uh, over, this, uh, over this whole issue of, uh, of trade and the evil of trade, particularly with China. He's got a documentary about the evil of China. So just a, just a bad guy. So that's, that's like the bad then there's like the, we'll see, you know, uh, and, and I think that you would have to put Rex Tillerson as Secretary of State. I have no idea what to think of that. You know, Rex Tillerson, obviously, really smart guy, a good CEO of Exxon, uh, a fan of Alice Shrugged. But does he know anything about foreign policy? Does he have any positions about foreign policy? Is he a- any more than he is very good at cutting deals with the Arabs? Uh, who have oil and the Russians who have oil. And this is, of course, where you have to be a little suspicious. Most of his dealings in terms of foreign entities have been with people like the Saudis, the Kuwaitis, and the Russians. That, and, and is he going to be very, very pro-Arab because of the oil interest? Is he going to be pro-Russia because of oil and because of his energy interest? He, you know, he won the Friendship Medal from the Russian government or something like that. So it's just... I just don't know. I don't know what his positions are. He has nothing in writing about what his positions are vis-a-vis American foreign policy. I have no idea what, what kind of Secretary of State. So I guess that would go under the ugly, just because you don't know. Um, uh, another one would be under the ugly would go Mnuchin, who is the, uh, the uh, uh, Treasury Secretary. No idea uh, what he stands for. No idea what he's going to do. I think he's just a pure pragmatist. We got Rick Perry at, at Secretary of Energy. Probably a good thing. Rick Perry promised his campaign to do away with the Department of Energy. I'd like to see for once, for once, one of these guys actually follow through with what they say they're going to do. For once, right? So actually shut it down. That would be terrific. But will he do that? I, I'm skeptical. Probably not. Uh, HUD, Ben Carson at HUD. Um, don't know, don't know what he's going to do. Again, a department that shouldn't exist. The United States government should not have housing policy, and as such, there should be no HUD. Right? There should be no HUD. Um, what else? Um, so that's that's uh, now his military. Guys, uh, so Flynn and Mathis, so uh, Secretary of Defense is is uh, advice on foreign policy. Uh, they're pretty good, except I don't know about Flynn and Russia. I'm a little suspicious there, but but they're pretty good. They're pretty good on 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 the Islamic threat. Mathis seems pretty good about what it means to go to war and um, and uh, how to go to war. 
so uh, and, and, and the need to win uh, to win the war. So I, I don't know a lot about Mathis. I haven't read up on him. I need to read more and watch his interviews. But he, he you know, a lot of people are compared to Patton. I'm a huge Patton fan. So to the extent that he even comes close to Patton, that would be good. Although Patton was also an, a crazy guy. Um, it's less that he was a fighter, that he was this or was that. What does he think? That's what's important. What is the ideology? What is the ideology? Uh, so, is he any good? I don't care if he's a general or civilians around the Defense Department. What I really care about is that he has the right approach to going to war and the right approach to, if you go to war, to win it. All right. All right. Um, so that's a quick thing on his, on the, on the you know, and I talked about, that, I think, last time, last show, which you should all listen to because it's pretty good, about the whole idea of, of all these people, Iron Man fans, and what does that mean? Uh, I don't want to repeat myself here. So what is doable for Trump administration? So if Trump was asking me for advice about what to do in the first hundred days or the first four years, right? What would I suggest doing and, and how to go about it in a realistic way? So not, not in a, you know, deregulate everything, taxes should be zero, uh, you know, bomb the hell out of, um, out of uh, Saudi Arabia. But in, in something that's realistic, uh, that's realistic to, uh, to present to a uh, given, given Congress and g- given the obstacles that they're going to face. And I, it, it let's, so let's try to conceptualize this. Um, it, now, the person who asked the question asked about taxes, regulations, defense, entitlements. But I want to I look at this a little differently. Um, the first one I, I would address, and this should be right up Donald Trump's alley. It's not but it should be right up Donald Trump's alley, is the first thing I think that should be looked at. Okay, so this is, this is my plan for the new year. Good, good, good for Christmas, right? How do we drain the swamp? Right? Now, I take the swamp as meaning cronyism. I take the swamp as meaning corruption. The, the involvement in government in, in every part of our business lives. The, 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 and, and the involvement of business in government and just this ugliness and the idea that many Americans have that the system is rigged and the f- system is fixed. So I would actually, I would actually put, a, put a package together of drain the swamp bills, right? And basically these bills would be, or another way to call it is end cronyism in America. End cronyism in America. And the number of facets to this bill, I think they're all doable. Very difficult to get by Congress. Very, very difficult to get by Congress because Congress is part of the swamp. They benefit from the bribery of business to them, from from being paid off by business. They have an every incentive to keep the swamp as it is. So, but but I would propose as as president, uh, and, and I think in the name of draining the swamp, Donald Trump can get away with this. I mean, people are ready for something radical from him, particularly in this area. So I, I, would, I would break this down into three buckets. Bucket number one would be bailouts and subsidies, right? And, and I, would, I would go to Congress with a bill that says, with a bill with two parts to it. Part number one is Congress will not subsidize any business, period, period, right? So uh, in this context, what we would do is is uh, delineate all the different study, subsidies, the windmills, solar energy, uh, uh, gas and uh, gas and, uh, and 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 uh, and oil, oil and gas, everything, right? Everything. So and subsidies. Now this would include farm subsidies, which would be harder. So the phasing out of all farm subsidies over the next three years, over the next four years within this administration. So start with. The, the obvious subsidies where government is just handing out checks to oil and gas and other things to uh, farm subsidies. A second part of the bill would be no bailouts. Uh, it would be a bill that basically says the United States government is prohibited from bailing out any business or industry. This would, ha- this would uh, involve having to change Dodd-Frank and involve other things. So there's no, no way. Now, the Federal Reserve... You'd have to redo the whole Federal Reserve Charter. Maybe that's for a different day because they could probably bail out businesses through the discount window, which they did in 2008 and 2009. But 
this is a start, right? We're trying to be realistic here. What could we do realistically? So government will bail out no businesses, not auto industry and not banks, not auto industry and not banks. And you would, again, you would have to change dot frank in order to reflect this as part of this bill. All right. So that's, that's the subsidies part of it, right? But this is all, all one big package called ending cronyism. Part number two is taxes. And in this part, it's simple, and Donald Trump has actually proposed this. 15% corporate tax rate, flat, and no deductions, no exclusions, nothing, right? Take away depreciation, take away all the artificial ways in which, and, and just look at some kind of net cash flow and have a flat in- tax. I mean, I, I would argue and I think it's it's doable to argue this, although I think it would be hard for a zero copa tax rate, a zero copa tax rate. But let's take, but you could do a 5%. Now he's proposed 15, but I assume that's with all kind of deductions and exclusions. A 5% tax rate on copa t- uh, 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 positive cash flow. Basically, um, cash in minus cash out. So uh, something like that, right? But... My preference would be simplify it, zero corporate tax rate. You only get taxed on money that goes out of the corporation. That is dividends, um, uh, capital gains, uh, 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 capital distributions, right? Right. So uh, something, something like that. Now you could get, we could get into the details of the technicalities. I would leave that to the technicians, but basically something that did not provide any loopholes, any exclusions, any special deductions, so that, again, there would be no incentive for business to come lobbying. Now, notice, if you just pass those two, you would destroy, what do you call it, K Street. You would destroy lobbying as we know it. There would be no incentive to lobby or very little incentive to lobby because you couldn't lobby for loopholes in the tax code because there they wouldn't be any. And you couldn't lobby for subsidies because there wouldn't be any. Now, the third area of lobbying, why you have to get cronyism in a cronyism bill, is, and this is the big one, the elimination of regulations. And, and this is very, very difficult. And this is the, the, the trickiest part. But, but, but again, if you frame it all as end cronyism, maybe you can get away with this. And here, I would have a series of bills taking on a series of industries which completely deregulates those industries. Now, you'll notice that over the last few days, and I expect in the next few weeks, Obama is going to introduce more and more and more new regulations, hundreds of them, maybe thousands of them, at costs of billions and billions of dollars, to make it as difficult as possible for the uh, Trump administration to undo. Now, every president does this, but Obama is doing more of this than ever, right? He's going uh, overboard. Right? The country just rejected his agenda. To hell with that. To hell with that. Anyway, so take the deregulation thing. I would, I would have a bank deregulation plan. Four years by which we deregulate the banking sector. For example, lower deposit insurance to $10,000 instead of the $250,000 today. So only really... Small invest, uh, you know, depositors get to benefit from deposit insurance. It, the way it was supposed to be originally, and you take away much of the mall has it out of deposit insurance. Uh, you know, slowly eliminate the power of the FDAC, the OCC. By the way, I would shut down the OCC, the Office of Control of the Currency, of the Fed, to regulate loans, to decide on what on quality of loans. To I, so I would eliminate regulations raise capital requirements and do away with deposit insurance as much as you can in the banking sector. Do away with too big to fail. We did that when we said no bailouts. And and you you slowly eliminate all the regulations that have to do with banking. Slowly. Over the next three years, they're all gone. All gone, right? So uh, so that's that's a big part of it, right? And, and, and I think you could do that. You put John Allison in charge of a committee to draft that law. You give them two months to do it, and you present it to Congress within the first 100 days. Then you deregulate the energy industry. 
So all the licenses, all the restrictions, all the constraints, you know, you just start minimizing those. Then you regulate business generally. You get rid, in whole, of something like Sarbanes-Oxley. So, you know, maybe you can't deregulate everything all at once, but you, you, in this bill to end cronyism, you present a substantive, comprehensive overhaul of the regulations in the United States. We're not going to get to zero regulations, but you show how all these are going to be trimmed and you introduce principles by which Congress cannot add regulations. At least, I think they've got a rule where you can only add a regulation if you get rid of two other ones. I'm not for adding anything, but again, if we're going to be realistic, fine. you got to add one, you have to do away with two. Something like that, where you, see, where you start seeing a dramatic reduction in regulation across the board. For example, I would appoint a committee uh, uh, to look at how do we deregulate securities regulations, the SEC. How do we go from where we are today to a free market in actual securities, in, in trading? So, uh, and you present that to Congress. I don't know if it's with the first hundred days. Maybe this is complicated. Maybe it would have. Maybe it would have to be. It would have to take longer than that. But in every area, in every major area, you present a bill to deregulate that area in dramatic, significant fashion, right? Um, so that is the Anconism category, and 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 that would be. It would be a big like umbrella bill that would have all these bills within it. And I think that's doable. He could call it drain the swamp bill. Uh, it would be incredibly powerful. And, and just that, if you did nothing else, if you literally did nothing else, that would drive, that would drive um, the economy through the roof. That would make that would make uh, the, the economic growth, that would increase economic growth by two percentages to GDP at least. You, you could get to the 5% GDP growth if you just did those things. Now, it's not just because all of those are complex and they're not easy. But imagine if you put somebody like like uh, John Allison in charge, rather than Treasury Secretary or whatever, which is a waste, I think, in charge of helping draft a bill that would deregulate banking completely. I mean, that would be amazing, all right? So that would be regulations. Uh, uh, that would be uh, the drain the swamp. Second, I would introduce a, a, a tax reform that would flatten the tax uh, taxes. Um, whether you do one flat tax rate or two flat tax rates, but I think here's the key again. The key for me is no deductions, no exclusions. You don't use the tax code to manipulate people's behavior. You don't give them deductions for charity. You don't give them deductions for mortgages. You take all those away. Now you have to phase them out. You have to do some things. Maybe you grandfather existing mortgages. I don't know. You'd have to think that through, and I haven't thought it completely through. But the point is, simple, flat, no deductions, no exclusions. You don't incentivize people to do this or not that. You just make it simple and flat. And you tax all income equally the same. For example, one of the, one of the things that is, is most important in terms of investment is get rid of the dif distinction between short-term and long-term capital gains. It's devastating. It's stupid. No economist believes that this serves any purpose. Uh, speculation, short-term speculation serves a, a very important long-term financial purpose. So get away with this stuff. Get, get rid of this stuff. Again, flat, simple, Right? Stop manipulating people's behavior using the tax code. All right? So that's, that's taxes. Simple. Simple, simple, simple. So that anybody can fill out his own taxes. Right? I, I think that is much more important than the rate at this point. Much more important than the rate. Now, the rate should be low, particularly on high owners, particularly in the producers, particularly in the creators. But Tax rate should be low, but I'm less concerned at the first step with the rate as with getting rid of, of making it simple, getting rid of the manipulative elements. And again, if you did these things, the economy would take off. Entitlements. All right, this is a tough one. Now, I would resurrect a proposal, um, a proposal uh, done by uh, Paul Ryan to provide vouchers 
for Medicare. I think this is really, really important, right? Provide vouchers for Medicare. And then what you do is uh, you provide Medicare recipients with a voucher to buy insurance rather than provide them with the health care direct from the government. Now, how do you do this? How do you, how do you phase it in? Maybe existing people who already retired get Medicare as it was promised. Anybody retiring tomorrow gets a voucher. And it, what you say is every 10 years, the voucher goes down in value by X percentage so that you provide an incentive for future generations to start saving and not rely on government for their health care. So voucherize Medicare. In other words, try to, cre- try to privatize it as much as possible. Try to privatize as much as possible. And lastly, or, or, or the same thing then, start the process of privatizing Social Security. Again, you can't do it all at once. And, and maybe a Trump administration can't say we're going to phase it out, but at least privatize it. At least let people open private accounts and put the 12.5% instead of to the government into private accounts. Start with 20-year-olds and start moving up. All right? So again... Put in place a few mechanisms by which entitlements are being privatized and moving in the right direction. Even if you don't do the phasing out because it's not politically feasible, at least give people options. And then, of course, on defense, um, I would say much more important than building out, uh, you know, Trump has been uh, tweeting lately about building up our nuclear program and stuff like that. Much more important than that is uh, much more important than modernizing the weapons that we have is to have a clear defense policy, to have a clear, um, a clear, uh, 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 you know, the people stop believing in what the United States says. And I think you start there by defining the enemy. You start there by defining Saudi Arabia and Iran as enemies, doing away with the Iranian treaty, which I don't think they will do, but doing away with the Iranian treaty. Uh, it's not a treaty agreement. Um, telling the Iranians in unequivocal terms that the nuclear program has ended and if it doesn't end tomorrow, you will destroy it. Telling the Saudis and the Iranians if they continue supporting Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, ISIS, and other terrorist organizations that they will be held accountable for every act of terror and every act of violence that those organizations, uh, those organizations, and then deploying the U.S. military with a full force to do it so that the Chinese and the Russians see that we are willing to use the full force of the military, and those two countries will be cowered once they see that. So that, that would be the es- essence of my defense policy. Focus on the enemy as it exists today. The enemy as it exists today is uh, the Islamic totalitarianists, the jihadis. Focus on Saudi Arabia and Iran. Deploy military troops to destroy ISIS and any other threat that we have in the Middle East. Uh, destroy, not build democracy, not... Go in, crush them, and come home. And tell the world, this is the new America. Watch out. Right? And, um, you know, and that's, that's defense. And then I'll, I'll end with, uh, with um, <clears throat> health care and education. Two very, very key. And again, the, he's got, he actually appointed two relatively good people for health care and education. Now, education... You know, one of the best signs that the Trump administration can give to uh, us free marketers that they're serious about moving towards more free market economics is to shut down some government government departments. Education, which has 150,000 employees, I would shut down. You know, leave this to the states. We want reform. We want tax credits. I want education saving accounts. That's the best idea about education that exists out there. But it looks like right now that has to happen at the state level. At the state level is where the education is funded. At the state level is where most K-12 through education is, uh, is regulated. Shut down the Department of Education. Now, things that you can do when you shut them down. The federal government should give no more loans to college students. Privatize that. Shift it to the banking industry. Banking industry is quite capable, quite competent to give loans to people who can actually pay them back. So shut the Department of Education down with all its functions. Return K-12 education to being regulated by states, not that they're advocating state regulation, but let's fight this battle at the state level. Get the federal government out of education. Just shut it down. 
Get rid of all the no child left behind, common core, and, and the regulation of private colleges and student loans. All of that should go away. All of it should be privatized. That's what I would do in education. Um, and again, then, then I'd advocate and push the states to offer education saving accounts. Maybe Congress can force them to do that. Healthcare, do away with Obamacare. Um, but basically, um, allow, you know, in a sense, find ways to get around state regulations of, um, of insurance companies, health insurance companies to do away with uh, restrictions to buy insurance across state lines, uh, get rid of all government regulations on health care uh, as, you, as you slowly do with Medicare. It's not, it's not possible to do it completely, but at least if you're under 65, there should be no involvement at all. Uh, so just completely privatize everything. Um, again, if you have the simple tax code, then businesses are not getting a tax deduction for employee health care. You shouldn't get a tax deduction for employee health care or equate it somehow, right? So nobody should get a tax deduction to buying health care, right? Special tax deduction for that. So uh, make it equal. Make it encourage individuals to buy their own health care through uh, health saving accounts and just privatize the whole sector. And, and there are lots of plans to do that. In terms of pre-existing conditions, you cannot force insurance companies to cover those. If you force insurance companies to cover those, then you're destroying insurance and you're just feeding into ultimately what will be a single payer universal health care provided by the government. Uh, if you want to still cover people with pre-existing conditions, create a risk pool, a government-funded risk pool to do that for now, and and uh, and then try to encourage the free market or find ways to incentivize the free market to create its own solutions to pre-existing conditions. There are a number of ideas about how to do this. It's going to take time for those ideas to evolve. In the meantime, create special risk pools uh, subsidized by the government for pre-existing conditions. And that's how you also solve the problem of why why would insurance companies buy uh, sell insurance to old people? Well, you find ways in which to create these risk pools that cover the pre-existing conditions that old people tend to have. And over time, uh, private companies will come up with solutions for this and then you do away with these risk pools or, or you find ways to create to create incentives to do this again. These, these are difficult, but you've got to get rid of state mandates on insurance companies. You've got to get rid of state regulation on insurance companies. One way to do that is to allow competitions across states. An ideal way to do that is to deny the ability of states to regulate health insurance companies. Uh, um, I think this has been done in certain insurance markets. I, I, I don't remember um, which ones right now, but, but there's a way to do that that Congress can just take that. Now, whether the Supreme Court would uphold that or whether they would declare that state rights or whatever, who knows? I guess it depends on, on how conservative the, 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 uh, the court is. A conservative court is going to say um, states have a right to do this and, and the federal government shouldn't intervene. All right, so that is that would be my proposals for the Trump administration for both taxes, regulations, defense, entitlement, health care, Education, all wrapped up nicely in a uh, in a bow. That is my Christmas present for the Trump administration and my uh, Happy New Year gift for them. So, uh, you know, anybody want to send it to them? Feel free to. Uh, I, I'll post that this segment uh, as a separate audio, and you can then forward it to whoever you know uh, within the Trump administration and uh, and uh, encourage them. Encourage them, and I'm I'm happy to consult on how to implement any of these uh, any of these strategies. So uh, go for it. All right, the meaning of Christmas. I love Christmas because what does Christmas actually mean? Christmas is about a celebration of life, a production. It's about lights and trees and gifts and good nature and benevolence towards other human beings. Oh my God, some of you might say. But hey, objectivists are not supposed to be benevolent because we're selfish. That is one of the great confusions and, and, and um, I, I don't know, lies about objectivism, not so much a confusion. 
No, we are the most benevolent. We are the most loving of mankind in generally. Objectivism is the philosophy of love. It's about loving yourself. It's about loving your life. And by extension, loving the people who make your life so successful and so wonderful. It's about thriving and loving and, and, and embracing the good that's out there. So, and, and what is more good than mankind? Mankind that's built skyscrapers and iPhones and, and this camera that is feeding this to Facebook Live and, and Blog Talk Radio and, and uh, you know, all the wonderful things we have. Human beings made that. Human beings made that. And you got to love human beings for their ability to make it, to make my life so much better. So Christmas is a celebration of all that. It's a celebration of the fact that human beings can produce, can create, can make. Now, they are bad human beings. We talked about some of them in the earlier in the show. Yeah, those need to be destroyed. But t Christmas, today, tonight, tomorrow, are about a celebration of the good human beings. The people you love, your friends, your family, at least the part of the family that you like. And not just your friends and family, but any human being out there who exercises his potential to produce and create and build. And this is a great holiday to celebrate Silicon Valley and everything that they produce. I know some of you hate Silicon Valley because they're leftists, but I go to the more fundamental. They're creators, they're builders. So, this is a celebration of all of that. Now, the Christians have taken this holiday, which was a Roman holiday, a pagan holiday, a holiday celebrated around this time of the year in every pagan culture, almost every pagan culture out there. It's a, it's a holiday that the Jews celebrate, Hanukkah, which is a celebration of, uh, you know, of rebellion, of independence, of freedom. I put freedom in quotes because it's not real freedom, not individual freedom. It's freedom of the Jews from the, from the uh, uh, Greeks. It's, it's a collectivistic type of freedom. But nevertheless, it, it's, uh, Hanukkah was a, is celebrating a, a rebellion of the Jews against the Greeks for religious freedom reasons. The Greeks were trying to impose. This is the post-Alexander the Great. They're not even Greeks. They're really Macedonians. Trying to impose their religion and their culture onto the Jews. Now, I happen to think the Greeks had a better culture than the Jews. So sometimes on Hanukkah, I kind of regret that the uh, Jews won that one. Uh, maybe it would have been better for the Jews and for everybody else if, they, if the uh, Greeks had won. But, but nevertheless, Hanukkah is a celebration of, against, of, of the victory of those who were trying to defend their religion against religion, religious oppression against the Greeks of that period, not the Greeks of uh, 300 years earlier, the Greeks of that period who were authoritarian and, uh, and, and uh, who were nowhere near, this is nowhere near the, the, the height of Greek philosophy and Greek art, uh, which is a period that I would have embraced over Judaism any day. Um, so Hanukkah is a celebration of that. It has a lot of mystical elements, you know, the menorahs, because there was a miracle that, that helped, the, you know, that kept the menorah alight for seven days. But, you know, it's kind of a minor miracle. Who cares? Uh, and, um, and the Maccabees who won were not good guys. They were a bit of religious fanatics, and they kind of imposed their religious fanaticism on the Jewish people after they won the victory. Fine, okay. But, you know, but at the end of the day, pagan, this, this, this holiday is a holiday that Christians... The Christians adopted, they, they, you know, they, they initiated a holiday at the end of December. I don't think this is when Jesus was born, it, to the extent that Jesus, uh, he, you know, Jesus was a real man. Uh, he was born probably sometime in the spring, at least that's what historians suggest. Uh, but the Christians needed a holiday to compete with the pagans. So what did they do? They, they took the same time frame, the winter, winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, and they picked a holiday around the same time. And then on top of that, they stole all the good things that the pagans, you know, had adopted. So, for example, in, in Rome, this holiday was associated with gift giving. So the Christians took that. Uh, in Scandinavia, and I think in Rome, it was associated with a certain worship of trees, particularly in the cold environment of Scandinavia, where, where trees were a symbol of life. The evergreen tree is a symbol of life. They brought the tree in 
to uh, you know into the uh, into the home, into the home. And by the way, I, I just remember this. Um, you guys should live tweet this show because that's how we're going to get you know hashtag your own book show with the link to the show. That's how going to we increase the number of people who listen to the show. Is if all of you like live tweet the show. Um, that'll actually encourage people to listen live and then to download, but it'll actually get people engaged. So uh, I, I forgot to say this earlier, and I should have said it at the beginning of the show, but please live tweet the show. Anyway, all of the all of the customs that today we associate with Christmas were created either by pagans and adopted by by Christians, or they were created by Greedy capitalists trying to recreate money. So, for example, Santa Claus, as we know today, is a combination of different characters from uh, different uh, European, uh, tr- uh, uh, you know, mythologies. But the Santa Claus we know today is a creation of Coca Cola from the 1930s, and a creation of retailers who have, you know, children sit on Santa's lap and ask for presents and all that kind of stuff. That's all a creation. That's all a creation. Uh, of um, uh, of Santa Claus, you know, a, a lot of the lights and the celebration and the benevolence, the benevolence of this, right, is a consequence of 19th century retail marketing. Uh, Macy's is, to a large extent, responsible for much of modern day. Christmas and, and the way it's celebrating. And I love modern day Christmas. I love Jolly Santa Claus. Uh, I, I, I love the idea of giving gifts. I don't kind of, I don't really, I love even the idea of Santa Claus judging you and deciding who's good and who's bad. That's very non Christian, right? Why should a bad kid not get presents? That's not right. Even if he says he's sorry, how about he goes to confessional? Does he still get presents then? Santa Claus judges. If you're a bad kid, you get, you get what? Coal. You get coal. How cool is that? Right? How cool is that? Um, so it's it's a, it's it's just a you know I love Christmas trees I love the lights uh, I love the idea of, of of decorating them with the gifts underneath the tree and again the tree was was Scandinavia celebrating their ability to survive in the in the face of this harsh winter and here was a tree that also survived in this harsh winter so it, the tree symbolizes our ability as human beings to survive in spite of that. Uh, so it, it's, just a, it's just a wonderful holiday. So those of you upset because it celebrates Jesus' birth, get over it. Get over it. Let those guys over there celebrate Jesus' birth. None of us are really celebrating that. And you know what? They're not even celebrating that because nothing they do actually reflects Jesus' birth. Now, you know, some of the music, some of them go to church, but even church, they go, why? Because it's nice music, because it's pretty, because they get to celebrate with other people, because they get to hang out with people. You know, it's just, it's just a, a cool holiday. I mean, um, and, and uh, we always celebrate it here, you know, we, we open presents in the morning and we have a, a nice dinner in the evening and we have friends over and we have family over and it, it's great. It's great. So, uh, yeah, it, it, favorite Christmas song. Somebody posted this on the chat. My favorite Christmas song is Santa Baby, particularly when sung, and I forget who sings it, it, you know, in a really, really sexy voice. Santa Baby is the perfect Christmas song. It's just so much fun, right? So, objectivists, if you love yourself, if you love your life, if you love the life that you can have, if you love the life that, that is there as a potential for you, uh, if you love the world in which you live, and if you love people because of their potential to create, to build, to make, to discover, then you got to love Christmas. And you have to remind people all over that we are the benevolent ones. We are the ones who celebrate life. We we love this. We love Christmas. We love everything about Christmas. And we love human beings. Human beings. Who is more benevolent than a good uh, objectivist? Now, there are a lot of objectivists out there, I know who you are, who are not benevolent, who are nasty, dogmatic idiots. Stop it. You got to stop it. 
right? It might have been Marilyn Monroe who, who sang Santa Baby. She would be perfect for Santa Baby. If it wasn't her, she should have sung it. But uh, that's, that's, uh, that's what I think it's Eartha Kitt also sings it. So there are, a number, there are probably a number of interpretations. But I can just envision Marilyn Monroe singing it. it would be, it's the perfect, perfect kind of combination of, of sexiness with, uh, with uh, 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 song. Uh, so we got to get over this image that we have as grouches so stop being a grouch life is good life is good stop being fearful and this is my Christmas message to you all and then we'll talk about Christmas movies quickly S stop being fearful of Muslims of Mexican immigrants of the economy being destroyed tomorrow there's too much to enjoy in life there's too much good in life to live in fear stop living in fear embrace life Think about solutions. Think about positives. Look for the positives. Maybe they're not falling on top of your head, but go find them. It's your life. Live it. All right. Christmas movies. I had a list here. Where's the list? Ah, where's the list? The list disappeared. Oh, 25 best Christmas movies. All right. So I'm going to list. This is a list. Rotten Tomatoes. RottenTomatoes.com. And it, it, you can you can post your favorites on um, on the chat. Uh, let me see if I can keep track of Facebook Live. You can also post your favorite uh, Christmas post your favorite Christmas movies, and I'll respond on the chat and on um, and on uh, on there. I'm going to go through these, and we'll cover I think many of of the ones. Uh, oh my God! You're posting stuff I've never heard of. You're supposed to post movies I know. You can't post movies I've never heard of. How can I comment on them? Right? I'm not seeing anything on Facebook. Nobody's posting anything on Facebook. I don't know. Maybe that maybe my feed is that is is died. All right. Number one, best Christmas movie, according to Rotten Tomato, is one of the most evil movies ever made. It's called It's a Wonderful Life. Ooh, a lot of people are leaving are leaving because they don't want to talk about movies. I hate It's a Wonderful Life. It's a Wonderful Life is all about altruism. It's all about sacrifice. It's all about not following your dreams. It's all about it takes a village and community. Ugh, I hate that movie. It's a socialist movie created by a Marxist, Frank Capra. It's brilliantly made, brilliantly acted, very Christmassy. Shows on Christmas all the time, but... Thumbs down on It's a Wonderful Life. It's an anti-Christmas movie, ultimately, because it's got the wrong sense of life. It's all about. You haven't seen? How can, how can Gene not have seen It's a Wonderful Life? You should all go see It's a Wonderful Life, because it's a classic. But it, nah, it doesn't, doesn't get up there. Okay, Miracle on 34th Street. Okay, Maureen O'Hara, Natalie Wood, how can you go wrong? It's cute. It's nice. I'm okay with it. Not my top movie, but okay. All right. Holiday Inn, that's number three. That's a good movie. Uh, and it's with Bing Crosby and Fred Astaire. Love those movies. I encourage you to go see them. These are classics. This is not, you know, your modern stuff. All right, now come my, you're on books, number one Christmas movie of all time. Drum roll. Yeah, right, you've never heard of these movies because you guys, you guys, if it's, if it's not black, if it's not like from the 80s on beyond, you don't go back further, but the best movies ever made were made in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Best movies ever made were made in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and here's an example. One of the greatest movies ever made, 1940. 1940. My favorite Christmas movie of all time is Shop Around the Corner. Shop Around the Corner. You've probably never heard of it, but it is a great movie. I've recommended it here on this show in the past. It's directed by Ernst Lubitsch, the greatest director of comedy ever. And it's with Margaret Sullivan and James Stewart. And you should all go rent it or watch it on Netflix tonight or tomorrow. It is fabulous. Uh, it's just so fun. It's so benevolent. It's so just it's great. It's just it's just a good, good movie. Right. Um, all right. Y y you've got mail. Somebody put up. You've got mail. You've got mail is a modern, pathetic remake. It's a remake of Shop Around the Corner. 
You got to see the original. You've got me all this cute. Shop around the corner is brilliant. It's beautiful. It's acted finely. And you just, your heart goes out to them. It's just the best, best Christmas movie, best romantic comedy ever. Okay, what else? Here's one I did not expect to see on the list. But I like, I like this because it's a great movie. And again, you've never heard of it? Typical, right? It's called Stalin 17. Right? It's about a German POW camp. And it's it's it really is a great movie. It's with um, with uh, it's directed by Billy Wilder, one of the great directors, with William Holden, Peter Graves, Robert Strauss, uh, you know, really great actors of the period, 1953. I'm telling you, best movies ever made, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Here you got Chopper Around the Corner, Starlink 17, both excellent movies. Starlink 17, really dramatic, really exciting. Directed by Billy Wilder, one of the great directors of all time. All right, that's the top five. Let's keep going. How do I get to number six? Okay, number six they've got as Tangerine. Never heard of it. Number seven, The Apartment, one of the greatest comedies of all time. I'm not sure why it's a Christmas movie, but again, Billy Wilder. Can't go wrong with Billy Wilder, 1960, Jack Lemmon, Shirley MacLaine, Fred McMurray. Wow. One of the great comedies of all the time. One of the great movies uh, directed by Billy Wilder of all time. So The Apartment, you got, you know, an excellent movie, fun, entertainment, cute. Shirley MacLaine, give me a break, right? So, all right. Uh, hey, Shop Around the Corner is on today, Saturday. December 24th at 4.15 p.m. Eastern Time on TCM. So, you know, record it. This is a great, great movie. All right. Uh, the Apartment. The Nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, this is the one with uh, Tim Burton. Cute. I liked it. Okay. Not bad. For a modern movie, pretty good. I'll go with that. All right. Ah, here it is. The classic. The one and only... One of the great action movies of all time and certainly a Christmas movie. In many ratings, I've seen this as the number one Christmas movie of all time. Are you ready for it? Die Hard, the first one. Die Hard with Bruce Willis. Now, that was a fun, that was a fun action movie. I'll go with that. Bruce Willis, Alan Rickman, just the, the whole, you know, high, you know, uh, L.A. skyscraper being blown up. So Nightmare Before Christmas, Die Hard, Die Hard's not bad. I'll, I'll buy that. This one's Arthur Christmas, number 10. Never heard of Arthur Christmas, don't know. A Christmas Story. A Christmas Story. Don't know, don't know. 1983, I'm suspicious. The Miracle on Morgan's Creek, 1944. See, this is a movie I've never heard of. It's 1944. I'm going to go watch this because it's 1944. In 1944, they made good movies. All right. Uh, let's see, what else? What else? A Rare Exports A Christmas Tale, 2010. This is number 13 best Christmas movie ever. Never heard of it. Okay, In Bruges. This is a 2008 movie that I've seen. Come on. It's not a Christmas movie. That's ridiculous. It's not a bad movie. It's a pretty good movie. But it ain't no Christmas movie. Ugh, I don't get it. I don't get it. It's, it's very well made. It's very suspenseful. You want a thriller? A fun thriller to watch in Bruges, but I wouldn't watch it on Christmas. Wouldn't watch it on Christmas. Okay, number 15 is Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Now, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is a fun movie, action movie. Again, not a Christmas movie. Robert Downey Jr. is excellent, and Van Kilmer is excellent. It's fun. Go watch it. Not Christmas. I don't I don't buy Christmas, so I'm, I'm critiquing their list. All right, let's see number 16. What do we have as number 16? A Christmas Tale. No, no. Tokyo Godfather 17. Never heard of it. Gremlins from 1994. Eh, eh, I don't know. Trading Places. I love Trading Places. Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd. Excellent movie. If you've never seen Trading Places, it's stupid because of the way you treat finance and, and uh, speculation. It doesn't get it. It's dumb in that regard. Uh, so, you know, you have to, you have to, you have to suffer through that, but, but, you know, you gotta, you gotta watch Trading Places, one of the great comedies 
of all time. Uh, excellent. Uh, directed by John Landis, who made some great comedies. And uh, Trading Places. Okay. And Midnight Clear. Never heard of it. Elf. I didn't like Elf. Eh. 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 All right. A Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol. Now, it's a good movie. It's just so wrong, right? Like the hero of A Christmas Carol should be Scrooge. I, I should have done the whole show on Scrooge. On the heroism of Scrooge. Why Scrooge is a good guy, right? He's paying he's paying market wages. I mean if what do you call what do you call the the the, 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 the guy who works for him who, who who always think he's uh he deserves more, um I can't remember, right? Uh, Cratchit. So, uh, if Cratchit deserves more, why does he go get another job, right? Obviously, he's getting market wages. What's he complaining about? Scrooge is actually building up the economy. Anyway, you know me. I'm, I'm pro-Scrooge, but A Christmas Carol, a classic. There are multiple versions of this that, that, are, that are fun to watch, I guess. Okay, here's another action movie that's very Christmassy. One, and again, one of my favorite action movies with a lot of sense of humor and a lot of fun aspect to it. And uh, it is called Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon from 1987. 1987. The 80s were a pretty good action movie. So, so, uh, so uh, Die Hard and Lethal Weapon, two action movies. And then number 24 is A Bishop's Wife. A Bishop's Wife. It's okay. It's Cary Grant, David Niven, Loretta Young. Great performances. Good movie. Quar movie. You know, philosophically. I can't remember all the details. But, you know, it's, it's a typical... Christian movie with lots of cutie angels and, and a lot of altruism. And finally, number 25. Number 25 is uh, the best Batman movie ever, Batman Returns. Uh, dark, brooding. Um, wait a minute. This is, this, is, this is not the one I meant. Well, anyway, this is what they list. I don't know if I'd list it. Batman Returns. Uh, Tim Burton's Batman Returns. Michael Keaton. Eh. Eh, I don't know. I like the other Batman, uh, the ones that were made by, um, I forget his name. Anyway, the more modern ones. All right, 25 best Christmas movies. Now, we've got Scrooge by Bill Murray. They didn't have that. That's a good movie. I'm just doing Elf. I don't really like Elf. I think it's kind of silly. Um, I, need a, I, need a, I need to watch a Christmas story. Everybody's been recommending this for a long time. What else? Aunt Mame. I never heard of it. Um... Uh, what else are people recommending here? Let's see. Let's see. All right. Um, shop. Well, shop around the corner. I recommend it. Um, all right. I don't see any others. There's a, there's a bunch of other ones. Holiday Inn has some wonderful uh, wonderful music by Irvin Berlin. So you got some stuff to go 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 watch. And look, enjoy this holiday. This is the coolest holiday. It's it's a holiday to celebrate life. This is the objectivist holiday. Forget about Jesus. Who cares? Forget about, you know, the Jews winning against the... This is why you got to gotta focus. Focus. Lights, presents, cool stuff, people you love, people producing and creating stuff, exchanging gifts with people that you care for, that you value. That is what Christmas is about. And for those of you who have a white Christmas then it's, it's also beautiful on top of everything else. All right. Hope you enjoyed today's show. Tweet it. Tweet it. Facebook it. Share it. Hopefully, Facebook won't make the Facebook Live thing disappear like it did last time. So, so please share the Facebook Live of it. Share the, the blog talk. Uh, we got to get uh, viewership up, listenership up, uh, back to November levels when we went through the roof. Um, and, uh, hey, Merry Christmas, everybody. And next show is going to be New Year's. And for New Year's, I'm going to do 2016 in review. What did I think of 2016? Lots to talk about. Lots to talk about. And then the show after that is going to be assessing Obama's presidency. So the next two shows are 2016 in review and assessing Obama's presidency. And uh, have fun watching all those great Christmas movies with people you love while exchanging gifts. It doesn't get much better than this. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year.